Welcome to Grand Sumo Breakdown, the unofficial sumo podcast for official sumo fans. I, I'd forgotten everything that happened in July, so I, I literally... Um, How? I'm on to Cincinnati, you know? Uh, so I, I actually went back and I, I listened to your review show, but obviously that was no help, so, you know. Yeah, of course. I don't know what you were thinking you, there. You listened purely for the erotica. Admit. I, I actually didn't listen to that part. I couldn't. I got, I got, I got two so sentences into those. It was just too weird. It was just, you know... <laughs> He was listening to it on speakerphone on the bus. You know, it just I was actually like, listening to it on headphones. I went, nope, 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 nope. Not ready for that. You know, oh, definitely not ready for that. Your, su- your sumo fandom just isn't as pure as ours. <laughs> and you know what? Why the heck not? Welcome to Grand Sumo Breakdown. You've already been listening to some crap between us and our host. Oh, yeah. Uh, not I'm not our editing host. that out. Yeah, no, nope. that's it. <laughs> that's that's it. the episode. Jake, hit the record button. So we're going. Uh, this is Ryan. This is Jake. I'm sorry. I did that thing where I like took a drink immediately when it was my turn, even though I saw it coming. I'm sorry. This is Flerk. <laughs> this is Mac. <laughs> and as you can hear, uh, they say, uh, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. That's that's why we haven't talked to Sumo Kaboom in almost a year. But we've got John Gunning here for you now. So we, we are talking with the apparently illustrious John Gunning. John, how the heck are you? It's actually interesting that you mentioned Sumo Kaboom because I was just talking to those ladies recently and I was such an enjoyable experience that I thought, you know, I got to balance things out and go and talk to Sumo Breakdown and put myself through that kind of thing as well. Just, you know, you experience the highs and then you want to, you know, know what the lows are like too. Yeah. It, it can't be a roller coaster if it just stays up high. The exactly. Whole time. That's not exciting. <laughs> it, it's the same yeah. for us, really. The uh, review episode for the Nagoya Basho is actually by far kind of our best downloaded episode that's ever happened and so just to follow it up with the lowest uh episode download count that we're going to be getting it just keeps that roller coaster going for us as well so it's the highest ever really so all of you watched it back yeah. <laughs> all and four of us yeah all four of us <laughs> yep. wow. all four of us my wife and stuff I, yeah. I clicked download on my uh on my parents computer you know there you go we got almost a double digits this time yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not the kind of person who's, you know, so egotistical that I'd watch my own work back. But, you know, whatever works for you guys. <laughs> wow. I feel like that big <laughs> shot right at me. Yeah. <laughs> no wonder John Gunning's game hasn't improved because he hasn't watched himself to see what he's done wrong. So he just keeps that same wow. poor level of commentary all the way through. I didn't watch myself, but I did wash myself. I thought I would take a shower for this show. Just, you know, <laughs> really step it up and get ready. <laughs> Yeah, we, we see you've got a very elaborate uh, and frankly just insulting background behind you. And it just. Actually, the only, the only reason all this stuff is on the floor is because I'm installing air conditioning in this room later today. So I actually get everything <laughs> down off the walls. And I mean, you know, and you're like, well, actually, if I put it here and the camera's right up there. <laughs> or better yet, you can exactly. put it Exactly. I was like, well, I could, I could store this in the other room or I could just, you know, dig the knife in a little bit deep, deeper by, you know, sticking it all in the background. So That's all right. Oh. You could just throw everything onto that rug that you got, wrap it up and throw it into the garbage can. It's just a lot more streamlined for you now. I was about to say, where's yeah, the bin at? It's about to say, you got throw everything, everything on the floor, just lay it all out, throw it away. Throw everything in the bin. Aren't you the one who's a Hakuho fan? Or is it Tochinoshin? Or which guys? I think we're all Hakuho fans here. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that's a pretty good place to start. Uh, as we. Yeah, that's oh. a solid snapshot of our relationship here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That was good talking to you guys. So we definitely will do this again sometime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. That's it, done. But no, uh, you brought up Hakuho. And so he has been a lightning rod of talk ever since days 14 and 15 of the Nagoya Basho, which you just recently reacquainted yourself with. So you should have pl- be able to talk about plenty. Uh, but just curious uh, your view on Hakuho's performance, especially that match against Shodai uh, and kind of the response that you've seen from like Western fans like us, like we're all about it, win at any cost versus uh, mm-hmm. some of the comments you've seen from the JSA or the Yokozuna Deliberation Council? Yeah, I didn't have any problem with it personally, you know. I love that kind of exciting sumo or something different. I think for Hako, you're 20 years in a sport, and especially when you're at the top and you've 
broken every record and you've done everything, you probably have to, there's an element I would imagine of amusing himself or just trying things that are new or different, you know, especially when you're, you're coming back and you're just beating everyone and you're, you're almost perfect at that stage at the end of the tournament. Um, there is a thing, I think we talked a little bit about it offline. So the reactions like from Kita no Fuji and, and stuff like that, obviously he's very sharp tongued and, you know, I think it was a little bit stronger than I expected from him, but with Yokozuna Deliberation Council and people like that, their job really is to complain. So I think people, <laughs> I think people take it too seriously, especially Western fans or newer fans that don't speak Japanese or haven't lived in Japan and tend to get their news or sumo information filtered through certain sources. Um, us. So us. <laughs> no, not you guys, but like it's, it doesn't matter even if the sources are accurately translating or not. There's, there's certain cultural elements or that don't translate. Um, not that they can't be translated, but just it's a different culture. So, so in Japan, obviously, there's um, the ideas of Hone and Tatanai, which is basically like your true face and then your, your public face. So a lot of the stuff that's said is kind of for public consumption, but it doesn't really mean a lot at the end of the day. I mean, their job is there to, to be a gatekeeper and to, you know, keep everyone in line. So I don't think people take it as seriously. Like it's just expected, you know, if you're a stable master, you're expected to criticize your own guys almost all the time as well, because you're the parent and you're, you know, that strict kind of parenting role is expected in Japan. People don't praise their own family either in Japan. That's just one thing. Like if somebody says, oh, your son is wonderful. He's gone, gotten into Harvard or whatever. You go, no, no, he's an idiot. I can't believe, you know, he's actually my own flesh and blood. But we it's, do it's that like with my that, family too. Yeah, it's, it's like that kind of thing. So it's just, a, it, there's an element of that to it. So, you know, expecting the Yokozuna Deliberation Council or, people in public positions to come out and say, yeah, I loved what Hakuho did there. That was really fun. I love the way he stuck it to the man. That's never going to happen, you know? So they're, they're, <laughs> all, they're always going to come out and say, no, that's not dignified and, or, you know, he shouldn't be doing that. Like, obviously, as a Yokozuna, he's not supposed to do that. But at the end of the day, when he retires, in, you know, in 10 years' time, when you're looking back at his career, people are not going to be talking about yeah, he was a great Yokozuna, but you remember that time when he actually did that round of applause in the stadium? Like, nobody's going to even remember that. Or that one match where he actually stood a little bit too far back from the ring. It, <laughs> you know, you're talking about a sport where people have murdered younger wrestlers and who have imported guns illegally and have joined cults, you know. And some of these people then are still, you know, deified as the greatest Yokozuna, the greatest wrestlers in history. Nothing Hakuho has ever done compares to that so i mean it's fine it doesn't bother me people that's their job let them complain but personally i don't have any issue with it you know if he's 20 years and he's been the greatest ever and if he wants to come in you know in a you know polka dot mawashi let him you know i don't care <laughs> all right so something you said really piqued my interest and i'm completely ready to toss away all like the prepared questions we had for you explain mm. to me these cults that sumo wrestlers have been joining <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> oh, well, you know, Takanohana, obviously, the, the youngest Takanohana, he was involved with some things, and that it actually was one of the reasons him and his family became estranged. I think Futabayama as well, he was uh, very closely involved with the cult after he retired. Mm. Well, the cult those guys. Are, those are yeah. some like big names, big, big yeah, names, yeah, yeah. too. Huh. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. So, Asashiro, for example, Asashiro now has become this, you know, the cranky old uncle that everyone loves to follow on Twitter. But, you know, when, when he was active, the stuff, the abuse that Hakuho gets now is nothing compared to what he got. You know, he was, you know, the fiery demon in the ring that had no respect for any sumo rules or sumo culture and was doing his own thing. And like he was getting, people were calling for him to retire constantly, you know. And then he was finally kicked out when he, you know, beat up a guy in the back of a car. That was kind of like, one step too far, but um, <laughs> but even now, even having done that and being, you know, a Yokozuna that was kicked out of sumo, it's more or less forgotten a decade later. Like everyone loves Asashori now and he's on TV all the time. And so Hakuho has nothing on his resume that compares to anything like that. So 
a year after he retires, two years after he retires, even the people that don't like him now will be probably, you know, singing his praises of what a great Yokozuni he was and how, you know, what a wonderful Oyakata he is and all the rest. So, I mean, he gets it and he carried, I think for me as well, he, he built up a lot of credit. So he carried Sumo through its darkest periods, like when the kid was killed in Tokitsukaze and then when there was a match fixing scan, like 10 years ago, Sumo was like, you couldn't, they couldn't sell even half of the tickets in Fukuoka. You know, you could walk up on the day of any basho and get a ringside ticket at the door. Like I'm talking about the, the ones like literally the Cushing ringside ones. So it was really struggling. Nobody was watching it on TV. It was scandal after scandal after scandal. And Hakuho, at that time, he was still in the, the white hat cowboy role. He hadn't turned heel yet in the eyes of some. But, um, <laughs> so, I mean, he carried sumo recent, really. I mean, he, especially after the Tohoku earthquake and everything. So he, he built up a lot of credit in the minds of many people, myself included. So his late career turn, I think, you know, it's, it's fine. I think he's just doing what he's doing. And he's, he's earned the right to do that. So there's just like a, a baseline level of complaining that, that has to be reached. And if it's something silly or something that doesn't matter, so you know, yeah, maybe, maybe we yeah. still see statements or something from, from the grumpy old guys, but, but whatever. I think there's maybe, especially because you don't see it in Western sports these days, but maybe in soccer and football, like if you go back to the seventies or eighties or even earlier, coaches tended to, you know, completely, dismiss their own players like we're not good enough or you know are, these guys need to practice more or, I don't know what they're doing like nowadays you don't see that the younger generations of players can't handle that kind of uh, management style so you mm -hmm. you rarely get coaches or managers criticizing their own players in public these days they might do it behind closed doors but they won't do it in public but that still is there still is that seniority thing in Japan. So once you're an Oyakata, once you're a member of the Yokozuna Deliberation Council, your, your job is to keep a tight grip on everything and make sure no one steps out of line. So, you know, you're not supposed to say everything is fine or everything is good. You're always supposed to look for stuff that can be improved or bettered. Um, once I get on that council, though, things will be different. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Then I'll be like, you know, the worst YDC member of all time. People will be calling for my retirement then. <laughs> we'll be the in the front of that line. <laughs> yeah. I'm counting on it. I'm counting on it, you know. I'll be there giving the middle finger to the camera going, no. You're going to have to drag me out of this committee room. So I, I am curious about one thing. There's that outside group that has been like, putting together put together a report and made like recommendations to the JSA yeah. and part of it was getting rid of the I can't remember exactly what it's called but keeping your uh, Ichidai Toshiori, right? yeah, One that, and a, a lot of people felt that that was targeted at Hakuho and it was like convenient timing that that report was coming out now do you think that that doesn't really hold much water and that Hakuho probably will be able to get that uh, status? Or do you think that that, since it is like an outside group making those recommendations, do you think that does hold a little bit more water than just like, oh, we have to say this stuff, it's expected of us? Uh, that is an interesting one because it is an outside group. Obviously it has some distinguished members. Um, yeah, it gives the JSA an excuse not to give Hakuho one if they, if they want to go down that route. I mean, obviously, with Shibata Yama and, and a few others, you know, there's obviously personal conflicts and people who don't like each other in any organization. So it could happen, but they're not bound to act on those recommendations. So it remains to be seen whether they do or not. I think if they don't, it's a disgrace. And I've written about that lots of times. Um, so obviously they couldn't under normal circumstances, but it, ha it has given them a reason not to. It's not that they're holding it back from Hakuho, they're abolishing the system altogether. And I mean, you know, the report does give valid reasons, I guess, why it, it should be done away with, but I think it's such a small non-issue. that The fact that they focus on it is kind of disappointing when there's a lot more pressing uh, issues that need to be dealt with in Sumo. And of course, then there's the whole thing of, I understand why they're doing, you know, foreign exchange come and assimilation to Sumo and blah, 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 blah. But that's always been the case, you know, apart, you can say that certain Rikishi like Hakuho or, you know, Harmafuji, these guys, they got kicked out or whatever. But I mean, their behavior isn't any different from the Japanese Rikishi. Takagenji is Japanese. So what foreign Rikishi are supposed to come in and emulate the Japanese style, right? They're supposed to be like 
Well, I mean, some of the foreign guys actually did get kicked out for smoking weed as well. So, I mean, you know, they emulated the Japanese style in advance, we'll say. Um, <laughs> Fortunately. Yeah, but it, it's just like that, you know, it, it's, it's hypocritical, that kind of thing, because you see the stuff that we talked about earlier, the cults and the bringing in guns and stuff like that. I mean, there's, I've seen far worse behavior done by Japanese wrestlers and, and Oyakata than I have by foreign ones. Far worse. Which I'm not going to talk about, obviously, on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be sued for that. That's for the uh, After Dark Behind the Scenes interview coming up later on special GSB Patreon <laughs> access or something. After Dark? Is that your, more of your sumo red shoes diaries, is it? <laughs> that, so anyways, our next let, question. That's yeah. where we just went back to go crazy with the erotica. Reference. I don't know, you're probably too young to get that reference, you know. <laughs> Sorry, was there a question in that? <laughs> no, I was trying to th come up with a comeback to us being too young about maybe we can turn that into you being too old. I don't know. Uh, well, I no, just, I, I got old. So how do you define a good sumo era? So if we take Hakuho in the current state right now, he's yeah. amazing, phenomenal. But how does that, like, you can look back in the past, you know, Takanohana, Wakanohana, all the other Yokozuna. How do you define a good era of sumo? Well, the Oxford English Dictionary defines good mm. as, <laughs> no, so, um, this isn't a, a best man speech. Okay, so the thing that's interesting about sumo in, in that case is you can't compare eras in other sports. Everyone knows that, right? You talk about LeBron yeah. versus Jordan. You talk about Manchester United of the 1990s. I remember in, in uh, I don't know if you're familiar with soccer, but Peter Schmeichel was a goalkeeper for the Manchester United team that won the treble, which is like the three main trophies in 1999. And in an interview, he said that that 1999 team would have beaten their famous 1968 team 10-0. And, you know, everyone went nuts because the 1968 team was, you know, full of legends as well. But his point that he was making was the speed of the game and fitness and training and everything had advanced so much in those 30 years that great and all as the 1968 guys were, if they were just transplanted with that level of fitness and that level of training onto a modern field. I mean, they used to be walking around the field practically with the soccer ball. So in, in other sports, it's the same. Like the fridge, you know, I'm very fans. The fridge, you know, is Asanoyama size, right? So he's, he's almost exactly the same height and weight as Asanoyama. In the 1980s, if you look at all the media about that, he was this gigantic, unheard of, massive presence. And like even his nickname was the Fridge. And, you know, he was the reason, one of the reasons that the 85 Bears were so popular. But if you look at him now, if you transplanted him into the modern day NFL, he'd be an undersized defensive tackle. So, True. you know, you've got guys now that are linebackers. It's the same in rugby. The All Blacks from 1991, I think it was World Cup, they're forwards which is the equivalent of the offensive line in, in football were actually smaller on average than the backs which would be like the receivers and, and running backs and stuff like that so all these sports have changed dramatically but sumo hasn't so sumo is actually one of the only sports i think you can compare eras so the, the training is more or less the same the size of guys hasn't massively changed it's gone up and down over like they're actually smaller probably than they were during the hawaiian era so I think you can. You can actually say if Hakuho was in Futabayama's era or Tayo's era or Takanohana's era, how would he have done? And he would have done pretty much the same as he's done now. He would have been utterly dominant because he's arguably the greatest to ever do it. And I mean, I'm good friends, obviously, with Konishiki. And, you know, he says, you know, he wouldn't have met Sekiwaki. So like, when we're talking, he says that, I just go, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> You know, that's that's the Gesundheit. yeah, that's that's the thing. Obviously, you know, somebody who did it, it was I would give him something, it was definitely harder in his time in terms of the physical violence that you had to endure. And you know, especially when you're somebody like say Konishki coming from Hawaii and there's no 24 hours, seven uh, 24 7 social media, there's not people, so all kinds of stuff goes on, and you literally you literally have to fight your corner in the stable, you know. So it's yeah. still bad, but it's not as bad as it was in their, in their day. So, like, those guys had it hard. And obviously, Jesse, then a generation before, Takamiyama, had it much harder. So, yeah, you could say there are certain guys maybe that wouldn't survive that kind of environment that are thriving now. But Sumo is still not, you know, a gentle place. It's a violent, brutal world. So anyone who makes it to the top 
depending on the state that you're in, obviously there, there are levels of it, but Hakuho to me would have been equally as dominant in any era that you could demand or that you could mention. Yeah, I remember seeing some videos, I think, from a, like a Keiko training session during the 80s, and it was yeah. brutal. Like, there was yeah. like a lot more kicking, like some spitting, like into people's faces. I mean, that still goes on when there's no cameras, you know. It's like the, mm -hmm. you know, if, if Keiko is filmed, it's going to be, you know. The only thing is, like, a few years ago, they made them take the bamboo sticks out of the, the training ring so that like, you couldn't be beating people. But, I mean, I've seen people use shovels and metal bats and stuff like that to motivate oh, man. guys, you know? So I, I, I mean, the first training session I ever watched, um, it was Koto Shogiku actually. I think he was still in maybe Johnny Dan, Sandame, somewhere around there. Um, yeah, it was probably 2000, I don't know, 2001, two, something like that. But um, so Koto Shogiku, I didn't know who anyone was. I went in and I was in the, the stable, but I remember looking around thinking, are there hidden cameras here? Is this like a prank on me? Why is nobody <laughs> reacting or calling the police to this guy getting, you know, beaten to bits in the rain, you know? Oh, I was man. just, my jaw was on the ground. I was like, I mean, they were just kicking him, belting, knocking lumps out of him, you know? Jeez. And like everyone else is just like sitting stony faced, you know, just watching it. And I was like, am I the only one that's seen <laughs> this? We see it, you know? <laughs> yeah. So that was, yeah, it was an eye opening introduction to similar training and, Obviously, then I got the, the first-hand experience myself for a decade, you know? So, um, yeah, it's it's still brutal and it's still violent, but uh, maybe not as bad as it was 15, 20 years ago. And, like, every every stage you go back, it gets worse, you know? Hmm. I'm, I'm assuming the training regimen wasn't quite the same for you when you were an amateur sumo. Probably not as many shovels or spitting going on in that. Or metal There's bats. More. <laughs> uh, no, no, not that kind of, not, the violence wasn't there like that. I mean, you would still get, like, driven to the stage where you think your heart's going to explode and, you know, like, water splashed in your face. Or There's no, they don't use the salt, so they don't have, like, the handfuls of salt in the face. But, like, you know, dragged up by the hair. That's, you know. Always keep your hair short. <laughs> up by it. It's like that fight club thing. Keep your nails and your hair short, you know? There you go. Yeah. That's um, why in amateur sumo, everyone has short hair. Yep. Yeah. That's well, I mean, it's that's a fighting thing anyway, you know? That's yeah. in antiquity. You always kept your hair short. You don't want someone grabbing your, pulling your head back and exposing your throat. <clears throat> but um, no, I mean, it, it was it was rough and tough and violent, but I, it wasn't like that... Uh, you know, non sumo violence that you would see in, in stables for sure. Uh, so, exempting Hakuho from this, I've also heard a lot of people saying that this is just like a down era of sumo, just like the overall quality isn't as good. Uh, hmm. You've been watching longer than we have. Do you, do you think that is true? Uh, I've always speculated that maybe it's not, people aren't all rising up and we don't have like two or three mega stars because the quality of Rikshi could just be higher and they're all at a more even level. Uh, but yeah. that's really a lot of me speaking out of my ass. So what are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you're speaking out of your ass. So. <laughs> that's fair. We <laughs> that's do it. Normal. Oh, my thoughts on the, the actual point. And that, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough one. You know, I, I would kind of agree with that. I don't think there is the depth of quality at the top of the band's game. I mean, obviously, Hapo is there, Turner Fuji is there, but after those two guys, it's... Show dies to no Zeki. I mean, yeah, that says all you need to say. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know... Yeah, that one hurts. <laughs> Miyabiyama was an Ozeki. Dejima was an Ozeki. You'll always get weakish Ozeki, you know, um, guys who have a good run for three or four tournaments, and that's their career peak, so, you know, they're not you know, so it's it's the same. Like it, you have Sekiwake that they're going through a rich vein of form, and they, they managed to do enough to to get uh, Ozeki, but you know they're never going to progress past that. But I just yeah, maybe the top division. I think that the number of people who have tournament wins is something that's interesting because like i think a quarter of makuchi has won the emperor's cup at one stage you know <laughs> but depending on who's retired recently but I mean, that's rare you know normally you have mm. uh, a much smaller number more either a couple of dom and Kazuna or you know three or four guys maybe five guys in a good one's okay but uh 
I don't know if there's a huge difference. I maybe I'm a little bit biased because when I first started watching Zoom, obviously when you it's like Doctor Who. Whoever's was your first Doctor Who is the guy that you like the most, you know. <laughs> fair. So, that is a fair I, I, I tend to think that you know Kotomitsky and Tochi Asma and Shio Kai Kai. I mean, I think that was a really strong Ozeki crop, and Takanahana Musashi Mara just retiring and Akebono, obviously. And I think maybe 20, 25 years ago, there was more strength and depth at the very top of the landscape. But uh, yeah, you know, it's, I don't think it's a huge difference. But um, I mean, it's still, you know, as long as there's, I think now it's more exciting in one way because you never know who's going to win, you know. Thank especially you. last year thank you, know? you. yeah that's it one was. of max big opinions is uh mm -hmm. tokushore you for example is like the easy that example to go to yeah i mean well, you can, you can you know, take multiple NFL, conclusions right? from it yeah that's why the nfl is so successful because you have 32 teams in theory that can win the super bowl you know because they have a, a built-in system where they you know the weakest teams get to draft the highest college guys and the salary cap that's why the NFL compared to, we'll say, soccer leagues or rugby leagues, which have two or three strong teams. Like in Spain, it's either Barcelona or Real Madrid is going to win the title every year. In Scotland, you've got two teams. England, maybe three, four teams. So you've got 90% of the top division in those sports who can never win a title, and maybe once in a generation. But the NFL has become what it is and so, so successful and, so, you know, so, so far outstrips every other league in terms of money and influence precisely because it's got that parity. So you, no matter what team you support, unless it's the Vikings, obviously, you know, you can say you're going to win. I have to get that in, you know? but I mean, the, no, it's the, point is, so, the sumo in the last couple of years has a little element of that. No matter which Rikishi you like, there's actually a chance he might end up winning the Emperor's Cup, you know, so... Definitely, it adds to the excitement when you're going, like, if you're going in and you know it's going to be Hako as it was for, you know, the guts of a decade, you're looking for alternative storylines. Like, you're doing shows and you're like, right, so we know it's going to win it. What else can we talk about, you know, for this upcoming tournament? So, you know, that takes away the excitement, obviously. That's totally fair. I feel like, uh, yeah, for, for our show, we came in at a pretty decent time. Uh, yeah. And, and especially... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> right. Goedo winning was like, was that the last tournament we didn't cover? Is that what it was? No, that, that was the first one we ever watched. That was the first one we okay. ever watched was Goedo the, winning it. About it a year before we started recording. It was the Haramafuji 11 and 4 you show in a playoff versus Goedo was the first. There one. you go. So yeah, like this. That's, that's how I would see you guys probably as an 11 and 4 you show. That's... Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll it's take a really it. Really good yeah. metaphor. Still a you show. <laughs> but yeah, you so can like. get to an Ozeki level with those kind of stats. Mm hmm. Yeah, if there's enough people out, definitely. <laughs> Sumo Mine, <laughs> Sumo Kabu, uh, NHK, Japan Times. If a couple of the YouTube channels go down, you guys are definitely right up there among the best, you know? Yeah. Who send shows still count as wins, man. A couple, <laughs> couple of QJOs at the right time is that's what makes or breaks a career here and there. So, yeah. no, nope, nobody Absolutely. remembers the circumstances when they see that uh, Y, which stands for the U show next to your name. They only exactly. remember the U show. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see Why? if I can cut that apart Why? to make it that we're he's saying that we want a U show or something. I'll, I'll yeah. keep you guys posted here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I should really have given you guys the opportunity to edit this. I feel like it's gonna be a very, very heavily edited show, you know. We should have live stream it for sure. We, we only like, agree we're not releasing this episode we only agreed to this so we could get sound bites from you to cut up and just put in our main episodes now let's go to our foreign correspondent john gunning you guys <laughs> win Risky kids. a you show hey, <laughs> thanks, <John. laughs> perfect yeah anyways <laughs> Well, you know, it's like I said, I only agreed to come on this because I thought the show was called Grand Simo Breakdance, you know? We'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> you got a nice little area behind you, John. We're, we're waiting. Show us your moves. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyways, one of the other biggest stories in sumo going on right now that we kind of wanted to get your thoughts on since you're, you're kind of keeping your distance from the sumo world for a little while. Yeah. What, uh, what are your main thoughts on the whole Asanoyama situation? Uh, do you think that uh the the punishment he got was worthwhile uh how how pissed off do his actions make you what what do you think about that whole situation in general i think he's lucky to still be in sumo to be honest with you i thought he would i thought he was gone i thought he was gone yeah. i think um 
particularly because of his rank and everything. I thought Abi was gone for sure. You know, I thought Abi. Yeah, I mean, Abi. Abi to me was the John Bender of sumo before you know his. Uh, like Abi to me provided one of the funniest moments of the last few years. You know, where he where he had that they had that meeting where they were you know reiterating you gotta you know gotta behave properly and not be tying guys up with tape and blah blah blah. And the media asked him afterwards, you know, what he thought of it, and he said he slept through the whole music. Like that's <laughs> that was that was John Bender. That was breakfast club material right there so i always i liked that but then obviously you know he went off the the, the deep end a little bit so i thought he was gone I was surprised that he survived i thought asano yama i if i was forced to choose beforehand i thought they would have kicked him out just because of his rank and everything so i think he's lucky to survive but obviously they've set a precedent and looking back on it now i it's hard to know because obviously he put people at risk and he put people at risk without their knowledge, you know, and with sumo wrestlers, obviously the high BMI and all the rest of it, you're talking about people who can die if they contract COVID. And, you know, we've obviously seen that one person did. He obviously had underlying conditions that made him weaker, but um, weaker, you know, in terms of his immune system and stuff like that. So, but still for a lot of these ricochet, COVID is an extremely serious thing, you know, and it, it, can kill you as it can for most people, but I think some more wrestlers are in the higher risk group. So the fact that he put his stable mates and the other people he was in contact with at risk of death, yeah, I mean, that's not good, obviously. So I, I mean, I think he, if he'd been kicked out, I would have been fine with that. You know, people maybe not like that, but then again, uh, it's a difficult situation, obviously, for everyone. And I think I said recently on one of the Grand Simo preview shows that, or maybe in Japan Times, I can't remember, but the point is that, you know, they take away the social media from Mikishi, and it's already a really, really tough, hard life with constant stresses and constant pressures. And I talk to Rikishi all the time because even guys don't use their social media, they still use the messaging functions. So not even being able to go out to the, the shop to be like cooped up in the same building. You don't even have your own room, right? For most of these guys, they're, they're sharing a room with 20 others. They have no privacy. I mean, it might, you guys might like each other, but imagine if you're forced to spend the next two years in the same room together, you know, Flair and I, I did mean, that in college. And so yeah, we did. Uh, and I, I consider us almost still each other. Yeah. Grand Sumo Battle <laughs> Royal. I think that would turn into <laughs> that. Uh, yes. I would but, consider um, these guys colleagues. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but some of them don't consider you at all, right? So yeah. um, <laughs> ideally, yeah. That's but that's the thing, you know. I mean, they they take away everything that can relieve the stress or the pressure, and then they expect these guys aged between 19 and 25, most of them, you know. I mean, I, I didn't cop on until I was nearly 40. And people say I still haven't copped on or got in any kind of sense. But like when I was, you know, 19, 20, 21, I remember what it was like and, you know, the energy and the testosterone and, and all the rest of it. And if you're in that situation where the people you're living with are also beating the crap out of you every morning, you know, the, it can become Lord of the Flies like in some of these stables. So it, they take away everything that they can be used to relieve the stress. And then, what do they expect, you know? There's going to be some guys that can handle it, even though they're not going to enjoy it. But there's always going to be, if you've got a thousand people in an organization, 700 rickshaw, whatever, there's always going to be a certain number of those people that will not be able to tolerate that kind of situation for any length of time. And Asano Yama was obviously one of them. Um, so you've got to have a little bit of understanding of that. So that's why I said, like, they should allow, they should allow them to use social media. If they're not allowing them to go out, if they're not allowing them to meet people. Obviously, they've eased it a little bit recently, but I mean, you, take, you can't take away every single thing. It's like putting someone in solitary confinement, essentially, you know, solitary confinement with other people. Hell is other people. That's what George or Jean Paul Sartre, right? That want to beat you morning, <laughs> noon, and night. <laughs> not want to, or actually beating you. That's the difference, yeah. right? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, if you're on the lowest rung of that, even if you're on the highest rung, you know. There's only so much you can get out your own stresses by beating up your juniors, you know. So, so I'm I'm, yeah. I'm curious if this sets a, a different precedent because we we know that Asano Yama initially lied to the JSA about 
why he was going out or if he was going out during this time. And typically yeah. we've seen lying to the JSA is the worst thing you can do. And that's immediate. Uh, you got it. Immediate retirement. Uh, we saw that with Osuna Rashi and the driving uh, scandal uh, where he initially said he wasn't driving, but then it came out he was. And so he was gone just for that. Uh, do you think this sets a precedent with him being an Ozeki and being able to get away with lying that that might not be immediate uh forced retirement for lying at this point or do you think uh, he got off easier uh, because he was ozeki and he was the next great japanese no ozeki? no 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 that would be the, that would be the opposite i mean obviously the higher the position you're in the more responsibility you have uh no lying that's not a sumo thing particularly that's obviously a japanese thing you know you're expected to that's why you have like the yakuza handing themselves into the police after they commit crimes and stuff like that you're expected to take responsibility for your actions and you know, the courts come down very heavily on anyone who denies their own guilt or, I mean, there's a whole, you go into a whole thing about that, but in Japan, you're expected to take responsibility as an adult. Um, that happens. Like, and if you do something bad, you're expected to own up to it. So lying is, is a big no-no in Japan. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that actually did surprise, that was one of the reasons I didn't think he would survive. You know, because he was an Ozeki who lied. So it's definitely surprising. Uh, does it set a precedent? It's hard to know because the, the JSA, as I've often said, it's not a monolith and the people who are in power and control change every couple of years. Um, so, and it's, it's, there's a lot of shifting alliances and, and things. It's very Game of Thrones, you know? Um, so it depends on who's on the Iron Throne for the moment. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't know. Precedents, I don't think, really are a thing in sumo, you know? Yeah. Um, on the kind of the question we were talking about, Rikshi, and just it's kind of a lot of high pressures, uh, I, I had a question about the kind of modern uh, training that they have in Hayes and like if there's room for improvement in that regard. Uh, I, I especially want to kind of highlight Arizo, uh, ex Kisino Sato. He has a new hey idea that he's coming out. I guess he went to a prestigious university in Japan and actually studying and had a master's. And I think previously he famously said he wanted to look towards uh, American football uh, mm -hmm. about well, how they kind of train and maybe they can see some improvements. But I think the two biggest things that he kind of highlighted were, A, he's making a place that's kind of outside of Japan. And I guess there's kind of more space for the hey in general. And apparently a lot of the rich, individual riches are going to have like separate rooms that they can actually, so they're not all cooped up together. Cause you said mm -hmm. that a lot of people kind of quit because of that. Mm -hmm. So I guess I kind of went off on a tangent, but like just kind of modern, uh, I guess, hey training, uh, w whether it, like a lot of other people also say that like they just do like the same exact thing they were doing a hundred years ago. Do you think it's kind of uh, has room for improvement or do you think it's been fairly effective that they're actually have modernized to do? Uh, That's really yeah that's a really good question i think there's two elements to that um one and this is something that i've i've spoken about before sumo is a lifestyle right so the practice of sumo is not just going to tournaments and, and winning sumo is continuing sumo is like how can i describe this it's like if you consider sumo as akin to a style of pottery or a style of maybe patched patched houses patched roofs or something so the way of doing it is equally as important as the end result. So what you're doing, the sumo associations remit is to continue on the traditions of sumo and pass it on to the Japanese people. So it's not a sporting body per se. It's actually a continuation of a lifestyle and, and, a, and certain practices. So in that respect, it's important that sumo is done correctly in training. So, you know, every single day doing shiko and suriyashi and the same movements every day may not be the most ideal situation from a science, sports science point of view, but that's not the point. The point is continuing on the traditions. So sumo training is sumo. So if you can't train and you can't do sumo, you're basically, you have to retire. So your daily practice is like your daily meditation as a monk or your daily prayers as a priest or something you're, you're doing the lifestyle that you're there to do so completely abandoning that and then you know just bringing in uh you know modern weight room and stuff like that into the stable which some stables do have but 
just abandoning the traditional practices would be being not sumo, then you're just giving up what sumo is. So that's not going to happen. And it shouldn't happen because, you know, that, that's the way it's been done. But if you're talking about from the, the health and the, the power and everything of rikishi, lots of them do. Isagahama has a gym in the basement, right? And you've probably seen, uh, Turner Fuji posts a lot of videos and stuff, but it's all on his like friends only thing. So you don't see those. But I mean, he, he's constantly training. I've taken Turner Fuji to CrossFit. We've gone to CrossFit together. I've taken other, like, uh, Inho and Ishira went with John Trail from Australia. They went to the wrestling. I think it was Nikai Dai, Nihon Sports Science University. They went and did the wrestling. And, you know, guys do judo. They do all kinds of, uh, you know, extracurricular training. Um, every When I lived in Ryogoku, every time I went to the gym, Takekaze was there. I don't know if you remember Takekaze, but I like, can't. Yeah. Every different gym I went to, he was there. He was in Gold's gym. He was in local municipal gyms. So, like, I kept, like, we used to laugh because I think, like, I used to go to just different gyms, depending on where I was. When I was training, I would train every day. So whichever gym was closest to me, I would go to. And I kept running into him, and it was like we were following each other around. But, so, it's, it's pretty standard. I mean, if you go back, you, there's a guy called Clark Hatch, who is an American in Japan in the 1960s. And he opened one of like the, the first modern gyms, you know, when it was still wasn't really a thing, you know. So he had, he had um, weight rooms and he had all, all the stuff that was modern and new in the 1960s. And he was close, I think it may have been Miyagino. I'm not sure, like the, the older version of Miyagino. So he used to come in and train with the Rikishi and the Rikishi used to come to his gym and work out. Uh, it, it's always been a thing that Rikishi train extracurricular stuff. It depends, obviously, on the person. That's more of something you do yourself. So it obviously depends on the person and how personally motivated you are. So I, I don't think really there's a big need for more modern, different sumo uh, training methods because a lot of these guys are doing this stuff anyway. It's just that you don't see it, you know. Um, I think, yeah, maybe a little... It, in recent times, it's become more structured, you know. Um, maybe they they know what they're doing. They're following plans, exercise plans, or training, you know, routines a little bit closer than they would have been in the past. But uh, no, I think uh, I think it's fine in that respect. Um, obviously, I think one thing they could do maybe is improve the rest, you know, better rest periods or not training so much with when injured but then again you go back to it's the same argument is really with Kosho Sedo with the system that didn't exist when uh, that doesn't exist now where if Rikishi was injured he could sit out a tournament and not lose his rank um there's things like that so you always have the argument of well the Rikishi in their life is basically training and that's what they're supposed to do and if they can't do it then they should just retire you know taking rest th this is a mindset that exists so uh, taking rest periods or, you know, sitting out tournaments, that's, uh, you know, desecration of the lifestyle, really. And, you know, it's a, a middle finger to what Suno is supposed to be. So you shouldn't do that. That's one mindset that definitely exists. But uh, I've completely forgotten the original question now. I've just been rambling so long. So, <laughs> so okay. you know, to sum it up, yes, absolutely. Uh, it may be that way. <laughs> yeah, of course, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah, John Gunning's maybe official not. answer to should, you know yeah. what ways can Sumo modernize their training is yes, absolutely, yes, mm -hmm. yes. absolutely. <laughs> so it's and at least twice on Saturdays. That's that's, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a given. Yeah. And find yeah. Takakaze because he's out there somewhere. Go train <laughs> with him. Jim. Where did I see him? Just I saw him somewhere. He was online somewhere yesterday. Somewhere I, I don't know. He, oh, you know where he was at? He was at the junior high school, the All Japan Junior High School Championships. They oh. happen Saturday and Sunday this weekend. So, yeah, he yeah, was we got there. a link for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inside Sport Japan, I think I asked them to keep everyone at praise of what's going on. Um, yeah, so he, yeah, obviously he's got, you know, those those junior high school tournaments are very important for Sumo Stable. So. All right. Uh, so we, we've talked a lot about kind of, tradition of sumo and what rankles people and what doesn't rankle people so let's 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 rankle some more people what are your thoughts <laughs> is this the I, I, thing again 
What? <laughs> I, is this the Eroshka thing again? <laughs> <laughs> We're saving that well, for the tail end. <laughs> We've got a surprise for you. Don't worry. Uh, I didn't agree to wrangling. I didn't agree to any wrangling. <laughs> oh, you just, you'll, you'll be fine. And, and don't, I, don't, don't worry about it. And I didn't get, the, you know, the big ball of blue M&Ms in my dressing room either. I don't know why you guys put my rider, you know? Well, None of the things. We're relying on the U.S. Post Service in some way to get oh. M&Ms over to you. So you'll get them in two months. You know, we will. Who knows? Yeah, somebody will get a bowl full of blue M&Ms in three to six months. Uh, but no, uh, there's a lot of opinions on the Hanka. Uh, we are a podcast that typically loves the Hanka. Uh, mm. what, what are your thoughts on the Hanka? It's a moving sumo and there's nothing wrong with it. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. All right. So no, uh, can't no over disagree yourself, here. everybody else. <laughs> yeah, I can't. So- uh, I, can't wait wait to the, you, why do, I can't wait to get on the Yoki Zushi Deliberation Council, John. That's going to be great. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, boy. I'm going to shake things up when I get in there. Um, uh-huh. I, may be, I may be ruining my own chances of getting that now. You know, by putting <laughs> this out there. But uh, obviously, if you're a Yokozuna and it's the last match of the day and it's a big, exciting tournament, you know, match that everyone's built up. I mean, if, if, if you know, Taran Fuji or Hako had hankered each other, hankered each other, what, to win the championship, which did happen, I think was Haku actually won a tournament by doing that to maybe Asa Shoryu. It was to Haru Fuji. Fuji. Yeah. That Haruma was the Fuji. that was the match that spurred the five thirty eight article that uh, spurred our podcast. Actually, right. So, but actually, he he'd done it before as well. I remember. I think it was the time Hokuto Riki almost won a tournament when he beat Asa Shoryu in regular play, and he was it was like one of these pusher thrusters that had this like red hot tournament. And he was facing a really young Hakoho on the last day. And, you know, I think, I think he may have gotten unbeaten or one loss. And if he'd beaten the really young Hakoho, who was just in Makuchi a couple of tournaments, maybe. If he'd beaten Hakoho on the last day, he would have won the Emperor's Cup. But Hakoho hankered him. And then it went to, uh, Hokutoriki went to a playoff with Asa Shoryu. So Hakoho has the history of doing that. So, I mean, if you're, I've been there. Like, if you're in the Kokogika and you've shelled out your money and you're sitting there and you're really waiting to see, like, this titanic clash at the end of the day, and like one guy just sidesteps the other and stuff, then you'd be, you know, you turn the air blue <laughs> completely. But, you know, it's, you know, that's what it is, what it is. It's not something, you know, you, you can't legislate. If you legislate it out of sumo, then basically you've just got who can become the biggest, you know, who, like, who can, who can put the most mass and force into, you know, you know, until you just end up with uh, what's that character from uh, the X Men, the guy who just, Builds up in juggernaut. A juggernaut. Yep. That's what you're going to end up with. It's like two juggernauts, essentially, you know? Um, so, no. The hack, I mean, if you take your henkers and stuff like that out, you're not going to have any end holes or, you know, issues or stuff like that. Um, so, no. It's fine. Get over yourselves. <laughs> Thank you. I agree. That's the point of agreement between us. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That we'll makes one. one more. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So, All right. What, um, what, uh, another topic I think we may actually have a little bit of disagreement on though. Um, <laughs> what do you think about Oshi specialists such as, uh, Takakesho probably being like the, the primary guy for this kind of discussion, uh, regarding like his potential, for example, like, you know, when he became Ozeki, I know there was a ton of stuff about everybody going back and forth. Like he'll never make Yokozuna. He shouldn't make Yokozuna. Like it's, his sumo isn't uh, isn't the style that we want to see at Yokozuna and stuff like that. What, I don't know what, about his sumo. Side there? Yeah, not wanting to see is a different thing. I I wouldn't. I've never met anyone who said that. I mean, I'm obviously one of the people who said that he wouldn't make Yokozuna, but that's he's a good exponent of that style. But it's like I said with Hokuto Riki earlier, who was also a pusher thruster. Pushing thrusting is like a golf swing. You know, it, the timing is so key and the mental aspect of it is so key. So, and most of those guys who rely heavily on that are not good on the Mawashi or they're, they're limited on the Mawashi, especially defensively, they're, they're not good because they don't do it a lot, you know. Their whole thing is- Kesho's case, incapable of reaching the Mawashi. <laughs> right, yeah. Also so <laughs> obviously, for, I mean, he's not bad, but I mean, obviously physically he's limited by the length of his arms and, you know, the size of uh, his body and all the rest of it. So for him, He's, <laughs> excuse me, he's, he's really, really good at what he does and he's found the perfect style for him. But 
the limitation of that style is if you're even if your timing is off even a little bit, it's really hard to be consistent. So it's really hard to keep that re consistently high level. And obviously to become a Yokozuna, you need to win, you know, two tournaments in a row or the equivalent. So it, it's a it's a more difficult road to Yokozuna for sure. Uh, if he makes it, yeah, more power to him. That's why, though, you don't see a lot of pusher thrusters at Yokozuna. And if they are, they tend to be, you know, massive guys like Akebono and then, or Musashimaru. But then even later in the career, those guys end up, you know, developing skills and going on the belt. But the difference between those guys is, I mean, they have proportionately much longer arms and, you know, they're, they have so much mass. So even if they lock up, they're not going to be pushed back anyway. And, you know, they can just lean into a guy uh, until he, you know, fatigues and then they can push him out. Takakeshu can't do that. So it's, it's really tough for someone like him because essentially you need to be hot for four months. You know, or well, three months we'll say. You know, if you take bash, if you get really hot at the start of the March tournament and right through to the end of the May one, you you need three months where your golf swing is you know absolutely perfect, and that's really hard to do for anyone. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a it's a tougher road to the top using that style for sure. So so I'm curious, why do you think? I I get what Takakesha does at his bodily limitations, but why do you think so many people? focus so much on just an Oshi style and not focus on the belt at all. Well, I mean, that's the base of sumo. I mean, that's the first thing everyone learns. Nobody, sumo is not a grappling sport at the base level. When you come in and you start training in sumo, that's what every coach, even if you're really good on the belt, the coach is always trying to, you know, knock that out of you at the beginning because the simplest way to win a sumo tournament is, you know, to push the guy out of the ring. So it's the fastest, it avoids injury. If you lock up, with somebody and you throw them if they if they keep holding on to your mawashi and especially if you're on a raised ring right you're going to get thrown out of the ring with them so your chances of injury to go up um doing belt sumo so the easiest and simplest way to have a long career is to be really good at pushing and thrusting you know and not get entangled with your opponent and uh yeah so but it's it's also it's a really good style. I mean, it teaches you, you know, basically sumo is like pushing the other person out, become like a train. So it's it's the first, the basics of sumo teaching and training uh, start with, you know, Oshi sumo or pushing and thrusting. And then you rarely see sumo stables teaching belt stuff, you know, that's more something guys do on their own um, because you want to kind of avoid it if possible. I mean, like if, if you can't and you lock up, then obviously there are techniques you will learn and will be taught, but um, it's more, it's more of a fallback thing, really. I mean, obviously, you, you have some guys who go straight for the belt because that's their thing. But uh, even when they were young and they started out in the stables, they would have been taught to do the pushing and thrusting. It just didn't stick or, you know, they, they were just so good on the belt. But still, like, I'm sure when they were young, like, you know, if they locked up, you, you'll see they come back and they win. But the Oikata's like, you shouldn't have done that. You should have just driven them out. <laughs> So would that apply for like, uh, I, I know a big thing of Mongolian uh, wrestlers is a, a big part of the background why Mongolians do well is that Mongolian wrestling is somewhat similar to the grappling aspect of sumo. So they may already have a base for it. Right. And they don't have the ring, right? So they can't right. push anyone out there. I mean, there's no, there's no outer limit to the ring there. So they have to throw someone. So if they've grown up in that style, you can only win by throwing. Um, yeah, it's 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 one reason that a lot of them are good. But then again, you can have guys like Hakuru who had no background in that who are still good at it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, his background was basketball, I think, right before yes. he, <laughs> before he joined. Yeah, the they are, okay, they no are obsessed. The Mongolian guys love basketball. It's such a popular sport in that country. But it's like even with Turner Fuji, the last time the World Cup was on here, the Rugby World Cup, we went in with the I brought the Irish rugby team in, and you know so. I called him up. I said, you know, I'm going to come in tomorrow with the, the Ireland team and all the rest of it. And he was like, uh, you don't have any NBA players you can bring. To this. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't care. He did, like, Nuts to the when, rugby team. <laughs> when he was, when he was like at his lowest, like down in Johnny Dunn, when he'd fallen all the way down and he was like at home and not able to go out. So he was at, he was at home and he wasn't, I think he was Kyujo at tournament. So he was not allowed to go out anywhere. And there was a, very famous NBA player who was here 
And his manager said, you know, you must come and you must go see Sumo and stuff like that. And I said, well, you know, they're all gone, but uh, maybe we can, you know, come in and, and meet some of the wrestlers or something like that. So I called up Darren Fuji and he's like, oh, I'm not allowed to go out. Can you come to my house for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I don't know about that, you know. I don't know. Like, I didn't know the guy, so I was going to say, "Do you want to come to dinner at this uh, Rikishi's house?" But um. uh, so I know Tom Brady came to Japan a few years ago, and there's like yeah. pictures of him with like Goedo. Do they get NFL players get like the same reaction, or is NBA really kind of the be all end all for like sports celebrities? So the Mongolian guys' basketball is everything. So I mean, when the NBA, when that uh, I think it was two years ago, three years ago, the NBA played a game in Tokyo or in Saitama and you had all the Mongolian guys going up to that so that for them that's such a huge sport in their country and they're all massive NBA fans mm -hmm. for others uh soccer is or baseball obviously because you know the Japanese guys they're the two big sports in Japan Teretsuyoshi and the Yobidashi who's there like they they like Teretsuyoshi got in trouble because he went to the one of the Japan games uh, a couple of years ago with the Yobidashi, like he's, he's always going to soccer games. The two of them are soccer nuts. And Terence Yoshi was wearing the Japan uh, uniform under his uh, yukata. And he pulled the yukata down when he was in the stadium. So he was just there. But he, took, he went and took a selfie of himself, you know? And then they were like, you know. He was still technically wearing the yukata, but I mean, he was, you know, pulled down so he just like a Japan shirt on, you know? Exposed. <laughs> but NFL guys, I've taken, I've taken NFL players into, um, Actually, one of your Viking guys. What's the name of that linebacker? He was in Tokyo for a while. Uh, uh, Chad Greenway. No, no, no. Really like, good guy. Really, really good player. Um, <laughs> Chad Greenway was good. Uh, no, but I mean, uh, he's kind of famous. I think you just re-signed him. What's his Bar, name? maybe? Ah, uh, yeah. Eric Bar, Bar. What's, okay. What's his, what's his first name? Anthony. Anthony. Ant I think it was Anthony Barr, maybe. So okay. he, was, he spent the summer in Tokyo about two years ago. And uh, yeah, I think I was messaging over and back with him, maybe. I think it was him or not. So, like, but uh, about to go see Sumo. But um, yeah, any NFL player I've taken in, or rugby as well. So, like, especially if it's offensive line, because offensive line and Sumo is essentially Sumo's run blocking to these guys. It's yes. exactly the same. So, um, I've gotten trouble. <laughs> I got into trouble in stables by, you know, there was one, one stable where we had a couple of NFL O line vets, and after training, we, you know, they stripped down and they got into the ring and they were, you know, pushed because I mean they they were fascinated by it because it was it's all kind of the same techniques and stuff that they use. It's uh, one of the guys like said it's it's moving like someone from point A to point B against his will. So that's you know the the heart of it. So they got in and they were messing around and doing the stuff and doing really well. And I videoed it on the Ktai on the, on the mobile phone. <laughs> and, but like the other cut that had been gone. And like when the Oyakata saw it, he ripped me a new one. What are you letting these guys in front of me? Which is, which is um, it's fair enough because, you know, somebody, you know, some NFL player, you know, you know, breaks a leg in the sumo ring. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> but you're like, hey, several years from now, I'm going to get to tell this story on a podcast. So this is great. <laughs> yeah. And when the chance comes, I'm looking forward to doing that, you know, when I get the chance to do it on a popular Ow. podcast. <laughs> Hey, I didn't say popular. That was your word. <laughs> so right. Do, do you think it. the JSA will ever make it easier for, you know, English speakers to officially watch a sumo broadcast? I mean, we're, we're, we're dying here. We're right. desperate. Legally, at least. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Legally. Uh, yes, uh, legally. <laughs> we try, you know, I mean, compared to what was there even five years ago, I think, you know, we, we got in the grand sumo preview and review shows up NHK. We've been able to show, Sen Shiraku and, and day one, I think usually live, at least the last hour of it. So keep pushing and keep pushing and eventually we're getting more. But yeah, it's uh, like on Inside Sport Japan, I think it was yesterday before somebody posted it, which is something that I've, I've said to those guys lots. It's like you need an NFL style game pass or whatever is the equivalent in other sports. So outside of the US, so for example, with me, with the game pass, what you can get outside the US, I can watch every single NFL game live. I can watch up to four live at the same time. I can watch every game for the last three years, 24 seven. So we get much more than anyone in the States does with local blackouts and stuff like that. So if you are outside the US, you can watch the NFL easier and better than you can inside the US. So 
you don't even need like that kind of level. But I mean, yeah, if the tournaments were provided live, it would be fantastic for sure. Um, obviously, English speaking commentary then would be a big boon as well because the people who are new, which is always a huge percentage of every English speaking uh, audience watching Sumo, you're going to, you know, there's a massive group of people who have never seen it before. So having an English speaking uh, commentary on it would be a huge help for them. Yeah, I, I hope so, but oh, it's so slow, you know, and everything takes so much time and negotiation and it's like pulling teeth, really. Um, I, you know, in my lifetime, <laughs> I hope to see foreign fans being able to watch sumo live because obviously if I was living abroad, you know, I'd be, you know, complaining about it all the time as well. It's, uh, yeah, but it's not, the, there's a couple of issues with it. One is just like the inertia that exists and the other one is, um, you know, the remit, as I said earlier, is to promote and propagate sumo, perpetuate sumo in among Japanese audience of Japanese people. So their raison d'etre is not the foreign fans and foreign fans for as passionate as they are, take up a very, very small percentage of the fan base as in absolute terms and an even smaller percentage of the paying fan base. Mm. So, there is, of course, we're trying. Only, we would like to. Say, <laughs> no, we want to. No, I, 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 that's that's an argument I've made. I said if it was available, it would be a revenue stream. I mean, it would be a very small revenue stream in overall terms, which I think. But then again, it could grow. You know, there is the argument that it, you know, the it's not bigger because it's so hard to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I mean, I'm I'm with you. I mean, I'm have been pushing for that and you know we've all been pushing for that constantly constantly so i mean we're chipping away at the the wall it's like that I think another doctor who referenced that one where he was stuck with a diamond wall and took him four billion years to to hammer his way through with his fist. So <laughs> hopefully we get there a little bit sooner but you know before the sun expands and engulfs the earth <laughs> i hope that we'll have live streaming of Simo for foreign fans. Mm. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So we wanted to do kind of just a lightning round thing with you where we just give you a rickshaw's name and you just give us like a real quick one sentence, two sentence thoughts on that particular rickshaw. Uh, so let's let's start with one of my newer favorites, Wakataka Kage. Yeah, difficult to pronounce. <laughs> That is his most notable feature so far, is yes. a, a rap verse of a name. Uh, you want this one comment, right? I don't know. I mean, he's good. That's good. Good, good up and comer, you know, um, done better than I thought he would today. But so. You've already said too much about Wakataka Kage. <laughs> I'm surprised you can pronounce his name so well so quickly. I I love it. And so I've I've said it plenty, so I've gotten good at it. I, I just, I like mutter it five times before I go to sleep. I just love saying it so much. <laughs> then he appears in the mirror and just goes, hello, Ryan. <laughs> uh, that's the dream, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Next up, how about Endo? Endo. Uh, has been. Um, <laughs> never was. Never was. Uh, good looking, apparently. Uh, <laughs> no, Endo's, Endo is your typical Nichidai so Nihon University product, you know, technically very sound, very sound technically, not the biggest guy. So I think he's um, he's done well. He's done well with the tools that he has. Uh, could have probably done better, maybe. Um, but uh, gregarious, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> How about Takanosho? Takanosho, uh, yeah, good guy. Like him, uh, kind of surprised he hasn't done better as well. I kind of was expecting him to make a little bit of a breakthrough by this stage. He's doing, we'll see, he's still relatively young, um, but uh, hasn't quite lived up to the potential that I think he has. Hmm. Flarek, you got one? I uh, No, not off the top of my head, no. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Lightning round, gone. All right, <laughs> how, how about Hide no Umi? <laughs> Inumi, uh, Tobizaro's older brother. 
Correct. Moving on. Also, also <laughs> Nichidai. Also Nichidai. Mm. Uh, so the the Alabama of sumo uh, amateurs. Oh. 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 Yeah. That's what goes down each day. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it's you know, there's. I think Nichidai have fifty five guys who've gone into pro sumo at this stage. So they're like I mean, they have more pro rikshi, I think, than every other university combined. You know, so. Oh, wow. um, yeah, and Hidenumi is the Hide part of his name comes from Hidetoshi Tanaka, who is the head of the sumo club at that university. And now he's kind of like the honorary president for life. But he, as an amateur, came up with Wajima, who was the only collegian to actually end up becoming Yokozuna in pro sumo. And he, he won the amateur Yokozuna title and then he went to pro sumo. And he's the only guy who's met at Yokozuna as a uh, collegiate rikishi and they used to say that Hidetoshi Tanaka was actually better than him but he chose never to go pro so Hidetoshi's name contains an element of a guy who could have been Yokozuna so there you go that's pretty cool <laughs> we, we did a bonus episode on Wajima that was one of my favorite mm-hmm. ones that we've ever done yeah Wajima actually uh, speaking of football and stuff you know Wajima when he retired he ended up becoming uh, the general manager of a football team in Tokyo <laughs> cool, cool. He was yeah. one of those guys that he was just kind of like a, he was an outgoing, somewhat rebellious dude in, in the first place. Well, there you go. You know, you, you want to talk about Hako, you know, sit. Wajima used his elder name share as collateral to get a loan from the Yakuza. <laughs> and, you know, he, is, right. he was, he he was basically persona non grata in the sumo society. It was like 20 years where he couldn't even set foot in the Kokugika. And then at the end of his life, He's done, you know, broadcasts and being interviewed. And when he, his funeral, they had like a, a gold, uh, gold lined, um, what was it? Not like a red, not like a carpet, but they had like some gold thing on the uh, floor, on the ground and the lots of golden balloons. And you had all the rikishi and you had all the guys from the football and everything. Like, you know, all these tributes and everything. That's like, you know, when somebody dies, everyone forgets all the bad stuff they did and they say great things. But like, it's the same with when they retire. So Wajima did, you know, far, far worse than Akko <laughs> ever did. And he was still crazy. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, one more up and comer for you. What do you think about Kota no Waka? Yeah. Some of family connections. Kota no Waka, son of Kota no Waka. Grandson of Koto Kaze, who was Sarigatake. <laughs> it was actually that training session that I mentioned earlier with Koto Shogiku. He was the, the Oikata for that. So his his grandfather, wow. who's also in the James Bond movie, you only live twice. Yeah. So he's cool. Okay. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. If you see the two guys around the ring, uh, who's it? Fujinishki, I think was the other one, and Kotonowaka. So his grandfather, Kotonowaka, the guy who wins at that bout that Sean Connery is watching, uh, he became Yokozuna really late in life. Hmm. I think he only won two or three titles, maybe. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, he was, he was, I think he was over 30, 32, maybe when he was promoted to Yokozuna. So there's time for Koto Nawaka, you know. He could, if he followed in his grandfather's steps, he's got another decade before he makes it to the top. Yeah, he's only 23. Right. There you go. He'll be Yokozuna in 2021, 2031. We got one more, at least off the top of my head Kageyaki. Yeah. Kageyaki. Uh, same name as the Shinkansen bullet train. <laughs> that's about as interesting a thing as there we've we ever go. had on him <laughs> perfect <laughs> as an <laughs> avid as an avid listener of our show i'm sure you're aware that kagiyaki is one of our like meme fighters where you know we just make fun of he will never amount to anything and he never has had any accolades of any sort officially really yeah yeah, yeah. no lower division you show no uh, special prizes no, prizes, prizes, no keen boshi no. nothing wow no. Right? Actually, no really <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why I can't think of anything to say about it. Exactly. <laughs> that, okay, That's I actually point. do have one Kageyaki fun fact, and it ties back into Wajima. I think they were from the same town. Uh, yeah, it's the, Ishikawa. Ishikawa. So, that's, so the Shikansen actually goes there. The bullet oh, train okay. goes. That's why it's oh. called. So he was like on his way to Tokyo <laughs> to join Pro Sumo, and he's like, I need a name. Uh, that'll do. That, <laughs> that'll oh, do. Got it. <laughs> I mean, he's one of the only Rikishi that has a single kanji name. Mm-hmm. But no. but the, the fun fact I had about him was he wears gold because of his connection to Wajima. Or at least right. he, he did wear he gold. Did. He, yeah. he switches around sometimes. Yeah. That's why Hakuho wore gold when he won his 14th title. 
because oh, yeah. Wajima had 14 new shows. So when Hako was winning his 14th new show, he wore gold in Owashi. That awful cocky of him. Did he just do it like on the day he would have clenched or did he do it that whole tournament and just call a shot? Clenched? Clenched the Basho. Clinched, Ryan? Whatever. <laughs> it, it, was, it was a very, very tight race. So before he clenched, <laughs> very clenched, you know? Those ass cheeks were clenched and, and as, you know, tough, tough tournament. Right um, around that gold mawashi. <laughs> right over he stepped to that tawar, like, hmm. I'm ready. But, you know, go on the washi so it shows everything, so you really do need to clench. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think he wore it for a whole tournament. He wore it for a while. Uh, as a sure you, I remember when they had when they went to Las Vegas and they had the tournament in Las Vegas, as a sure you, wore gold in the washi as well. So, um, cool. yeah. All right. Well, if everybody uh, else has read out of names, I got a, just a couple more. Uh, Hoku Seho. Big. Big. <laughs> Big. <laughs> Hodor. Um, he is he's, he's a Hodor. Um, he's huge. He's massive. He's like one of the biggest humans I've ever seen. Uh, I, if you go back, I think maybe two years ago, a year ago, two years ago, I wrote a Japan's Art, Times article where I said that Hako could go from becoming one of the greatest Yokozuna to one of the greatest Oyakata if Hokuseho plays, uh, pans out. Which I expect him to do. He's still a little rough and raw around the edges, but I mean, the fact that, yeah, you know, you're a kid in an airport and you run into Hakuho and he says, like, you know, come join the bros and then you end up doing it. Uh, <laughs> like, his mother had his Facebook account back then and, like, she started following all these sumo people and she followed me and I was like, oh, or friended me. And then I was, I was, uh, I think it's his account now. Maybe he, he has it now, but his, you know, he was like five or something at the time and suddenly I got this friend request and I accepted it and then I'm looking at this five or six year old kid in Mon a Mongolian kid in Hokkaido and I was like who is this person and why how do I know them why are they sitting <laughs> and then it was like he's doing kids similar like oh okay there's some similar connection and it's like kind of forgot about it and then like a decade later he's like this you know or a decade and a half later now at this stage mm -hmm. but giant um, <laughs> he has all the potential in the world you know uh if he can if he can knock some of the rust off uh, knock some of the edges off his sumo just by size and power alone he's gonna i mean he's, he's sekitori now next special right so yep um six yeah. foot six he is almost he is like the only other guy i can name off the top of my head that's listed as two meters high is akebono mm -hmm. and he has so much room to fill. I mean, he could be 180 kilos without even looking fat, I think. I mean, I stood beside him, uh, when was the last time I met him? December, I think it was. It was the last time I met Hokuseho. And like, I did, there's a photo of me, like him and the other guy who's joining Kotoshu's stable, another Mongolian. <laughs> um, but like, that guy is also huge. But like, somebody, uh, Hokuseho is wearing one of those massive overcoats. And somebody said, it's like one of those cartoons, you have three kids standing on each other's shoulders, you know? <laughs> he's just big, big, big. <laughs> yeah, officially he's listed at 164 kilos, but I feel like that's kind of conservative. And you, yeah, and if you look at him, he doesn't even look heavy, you know? He looks mm, like, yeah. you know, he could, he could put on another 20, 30 kilos. I mean, he could be up at, he could be Alan Karayev kind of numbers where he's like 200 centimeters and 200 kilograms. Um, but without Karayev's like, massive like he, he could wear it much better All right. you probably don't even know who alan karayev is do you we were just moving on we assumed it was yeah, a it's, really like, guy yeah, thing. it's a reference <laughs> you, you, uh, keep, you keep saying names as if we're supposed to understand who they are i thought you were a sumo podcast what did you know <laughs> we're a no, midwestern I'm, I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. I, I didn't think you were a sumo podcast. <laughs> <laughs> there it is fair enough fair enough all right well now I feel kind of deflated, but I do have one more name. <laughs> oh, Brady. Uh, Ura. Oh, sorry, Word Association deflated. <laughs> hey. Go on. Speaking of scandals. Yeah. What about Ura? Ah, Ura's great, isn't he? Ura's speaking <laughs> of university. So there's two, the two big college football rivals in Japan is Nichidai in Tokyo, and then in the west of Japan, you have Kwansei Gakuin Fighters. And they're the one with the most university national titles in the world of any football team, but they've only ever produced one rickshaw, and that's Ura. 
And Ura, to me, Ura, his win in the world games against uh, Bat Al Batayev, the Russian guy who's also a brilliant sumo wrestler, is one of the top two sumo moves I've ever seen. <clears throat> if you ever um, <clears throat> get a chance, just Google that. Uh, I think it's uh, Batayev, maybe. Batayev and Ura, it's amateur sumo world games. You can see that video is online. The throw was just insane. So when he was an amateur, like we used to watch him and he was just like, he was made of rubber. He just couldn't, you couldn't beat him. Nobody could beat him because you would throw him and he would still be standing, you know, it was just like, and then he became a pro and he put on all that extra weight and I was like, what's he doing? Like he's, you know, this is completely ruining his, his, his whole thing was like speed and skill and, you know, so I, I didn't get it at all, but obviously he thought he needed to bulk up to survive the rigors of pro sumo. And then, you know, you saw the results and knees keep going out. And so I, I feel like that was a mistake. He could have been, he could have survived at Elijah Wage, like Takanoyama, uh, Taka, Takanoyama, but actually been, you know, far, far superior because Ura is one of the most technically skilled Richie I've ever seen. Um, so I really wish he, he had not put on all that weight after he turned pro that he's maybe not stayed as light as he was, because obviously he was, you know, really slim and all the rest. But uh, I would love to have seen what he was as an amateur in the top division. Because, I mean, it's, it's he'd be like in hole, but far, far better and bigger. You know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, no, he's just, Ura's, you know, sumo sense and skills was out of this world, you know. He did things as an amateur, you just thought were physically impossible. Even um, as a so pro, the like the the backdrop Kimarite that he's landed Holy a couple yeah. times has been like he wait, still does it, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it really says something about how special a guy is when like you need to study vocabulary because of what he just did, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I don't marry in some of the guys <laughs> when he's on there, like you know, the list of Kimarite, like come on, just do something, you know. Which one is it today? Come on. Yeah. Where's my Tom <laughs> Zabel book? <laughs> so, like, what the hell is that? You know? But like even um, yeah, you can say like you can see. On the live broadcasts of Sumo, if you look, you can see the two Gyoji sitting down. They have the Perspex in front of them now. They're usually just wearing shirts and ties. Uh, you see the microphone, the, the stadium announcers, they're in the background, just like three or, uh, three or four rows back. Usually on the right-hand side, as you look at the screen, if you're watching live Sumo, you can just see them in the audience. It's like two guys in shirts with a microphone and the desk. They're two Gyoji. So they're the ones who announced the uh, Kimari day. But you can all see them like frantically, like, you know, confirming, you know, <laughs> crap. Yeah, yeah. Normally, it's just like he pushes the button, you're a you're a you know, and then it's like, Ur is up, and he's like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> Get the book. Uh, I, I, am, I am curious about something. You probably aren't allowed to say, but I'm, do you have like favorites that you are cheering for, or are you not allowed to state any biases that you have? You no, know, cheering in the press box, huh? Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say favorites. I mean, obviously, it's, it's a little bit different. When I, when I was, before I was working in Sumo Media, I was a Sumo fan. So my all-time favorite is Wakan Ohana, the first Yokozuna Wakan Ohana, the demon of the dojo. And it's like one of my main Sumo regrets that I didn't get to meet him in person before he died. I think I'm up to, like, I, I've met, now I think it's 17 or 18 Yokozuna in person. So, but. We've got I, one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we we almost we catching up. Oh, yeah. you met one. Okay. We, we met Sato, right? Kise no Sato. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Peaked, yeah. we peaked early. Yeah. We yeah. peaked way I saw early. That. Yeah. 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 Great guy. Um. No, but I never met Walker Hannah. So uh, him and when I was watching, I used to like Kotomitsky. He was an Ozeki. Um. Then the the dragon guys I like the guys who were all born 1976 the year of the dragon you had Kotomitsuki, Chiyotaikai, Tochiyazuma, Kinkayama, uh, Wakano Sato. So like I mean the big bunch at the top of Makuchi when I was watching in the early 2000s were all born in 76. So I liked a lot of those guys. Now it's more about how well I know somebody. So obviously Turn of Fuji, you know, we're I mean, we don't meet as much as we used to, obviously, but uh, it's still really close. Sounds like uh, Takakaze is probably at the top of that list. Hmm. Takakaze, my old gym partner, I haven't <laughs> met him in a while. Uh, it depends, you know, like I, a lot of the guys maybe he's still in the lower divisions, you know, that'd be closer to, but I, I, maybe I'm not as emotionally invested in wins and losses as I used to be when I was a fan, you know, that just happens when you work in the media. It's your job. 
you know, you, you have you have a different uh, outlook on it. And especially, you know, when you get the script of the whole tournament yeah, a month beforehand, you know, it's going to be that. Anyway. <laughs> um, this is the narrative. We got it. <laughs> People hate when I say stuff like that. <laughs> We're all pro wrestling fans. We make I, it, I, we joke. <laughs> I, lost, I think I got banned from somewhere online for actually making that joke one time. You know? Oh. <laughs> so obviously we don't get it a month before. It's like the day. There. Yeah, it's been much shorter <laughs> the than day that. Before. But yeah, here you go. <laughs> Crap. That way it doesn't sound Ooh. as rehearsed when you're going through the commentary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. You know. A lot of it's redacted anyway. I mean, they, they don't show the special prices. That's why we just don't really. <laughs> Gotta leave some element in there. Where's these special prizes? <laughs> Bastards, you know? All right. yeah. Flerick, did you have anything else you wanted to go over with John? Oh, uh, yeah. I had one uh, longer question. Uh, it, you were kind of talking a uh, little bits about with uh, the collegiate sumo, like uh, the people were coming from that. But yeah. I've heard like the collegiate sumo has actually got fairly developed the last couple of decades. And like there's a lot of pros coming from it nowadays. And I've heard like for foreigners like who can't get into a stable, like they're recommending they go into the collegiate system to kind of check it out. And then they people get recruited from there. So I was yeah. kind of more like just idea of what the scene's like in yeah. the college scene. Yeah, I think I was the one who made that recommendation. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I might drive from you. It's possible. Yeah, I, I've made that for, because pro sim was so hard to get into, right? And yeah. the other thing is, having put guys into pro sumo, like, so Osu Narashi, I helped him get in. Homer, Homer and Nishiki was basically, you know, Brody. That was me. I put him in. So the thing is, 90%, I mean, I get guys contacting me not daily, but at least, you know, weekly anyway, how do I join the pros and stuff like that. But most of them have clearly no idea of what it's like. So you see guys, you know, they see the top division and they see the fame and the glory and they don't really understand the hell that sumo is. And you know that they, you know, my, my first thing when people try to join sumo is always, you know, if they're serious and they have some kind of background experience or they're young enough and strong enough and big enough and they actually could make it as a rikishi, I try to dissuade them. Always, always. I just like it's not even the guys who are successful, a lot of them will say, like, if they had a time over again, they wouldn't do it. It just it takes such a toll physically and mentally. And obviously, you have the whole concussion issue, the CTE, and all that, which isn't even talked about in Japan, but which is a big issue in sumo. But even apart from that, like Konishiki just has to take these, you know, so much, so many painkillers constantly. He's in constant pain from mm. his as a rikishi, you know. I mean, you can, you can just see, like, everything he has to move or stand up or sit down. It's just agony, you know. It's So physically, mentally, emotionally, everything, sumo just wrecks you. It destroys you. So it's it's not a lifestyle you would recommend for people, you know. So I the thing about going into the university thing is if it's possible and somebody can transfer to a university or, you know, start a university in Japan that has a strong sumo club, it's a far, far better route to go in because then – you know, you get a university education, obviously you're going to get a degree. So, you you know, you're not, if you're joining the pros, you're going to have to join at what, like 17, 18, maybe it's kind of pushing it if you're foreign for the upper limit. It's 22 officially, but they're not going to take 21-year-old foreigners. Um, so you're foregoing third-level education. And, you know, you guys in the States, obviously, you know, you have to shout massive amounts of money to go to university. I come from a country where we got paid to go to university by the government, right? So, oh wow, yeah, that so been nice. That's you know, you actually make money as a student. I mean, you know, I think in Germany, you can you can get up to two or three degrees, like undergraduate degrees. You can get funded from the government. I'm not sure, but like most of Europe, you know, university is free pretty much for most people, or like you actually get, you know, you get allowances, housing allowances, and you know, rent allowance, food allowance, stuff like that from the government. So, it's actually like a low paid job to be a student, you know? Um, and you never have to pay any of that back. But Japan- All right, well, all right, enough rubbing it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the point about that is you're not gonna go bankrupt. It's not like, you know, you're gonna end up with massive debt like you would if you're going to college in the States. So you can come to Japan, you can get your third level education. Uh, if you come from the States, especially, you know, it's you have a degree, and you don't have this huge debt and then if you join the sumo club, you'll get that really tough, rigorous sumo life. And you'll know if you have what it takes to go into pro sumo. And then you won't even be foreign uh, if you win one of the, oh, then again, no, that's a little bit different. But 
um, you know, I mean, if you win a tournament, you can just join a match to 15. If you win one of the national tournaments, uh, if you win two of them, you can join a match to 10. Even if you just score a finals, you can join San Dame, right? So um, there's, there's so many advantages. You're joining the pros then, you know, 22, whatever. So you're, you're a bit more mature. You're not, you're not going to be traumatized for life like you would be if you were, you know, 16 and going into a similar stable. So I think it's, I don't think it's a route that's, you know, all that open, but if it's possible, I would recommend that ahead of just going straight into a stable. On, on that note, I know you were kind of dissu- kind of dissuading people to get into sumo, but it, hypothetically, if four people, like three plus year old white dudes, wanted mm. to get into with no sumo wrestling experience, but with hearts of gold and dream to become Yokozuna, could you get us in? Well, like I said, it's an actually absolutely hellish world that will destroy you. So, absolutely, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> um, okay. I already have to edit this you know, podcast. Okay. I'm mean, okay. <laughs> like, you know, on the phone to stables. We take these guys. Please take these guys. <laughs> destroy them. What? So, yeah, we have some stipulations. Uh, we, we want to get an Ozeki, but uh, Ozeki rank. But if, uh, you know, that's a little bit tough, we'll take Sekiwaki or just Mike Ashir one. Yeah. You'll take them? Oh, you want to be it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can get, get us yeah, in you know. there. Yeah, if you, you could just, just want to become up. Yokozuna, but like not all that grind up to the top. You just yeah, don't put salt in my eyes. <laughs> that did yeah. it sound fun. Yeah. But, want, but we want the glory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's just laughing. Yes. <laughs> go first, go first, absolutely. You know, it's, I, I, okay. I did, you buzz and you can go in there since corona's over you can jump up into the iskama there was an american guy who did that actually uh, yeah he came he went into isagahama recently he was saying he was going to join prosim or something he got battered from pillar to pillar. Uh, <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. We'll, we'll send mac in first and see how he does and that if sounds... he comes out okay then the rest <laughs> of us will go <laughs> the you things know, guys, i do for this show <laughs> it, it took us an hour and a half but we finally had one joke that left him speechless for a moment <laughs> success so i think we can probably move on to our <laughs> yeah, which one is the raja role who's going to get into the ring and get tossed around like a rag doll it's probably Honestly, me i was gonna say i, I was gonna say probably me one. because i'm probably the most like ballistically appropriate given my size <laughs> being the smallest guy on the show <laughs> but i'm but the it, daredevil so. that's also true <laughs> but anyways yeah ryan we had one more segment here yeah so something that i used to do on this podcast i haven't done enough recently and i am inspired to start doing it again is surprise people with quizzes uh so john it is time to test some of your sumo knowledge uh i've got i've got three different categories uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right first category is commodity uh so which which commodity is being used when <laughs> <laughs> Near the edge of the doyo, the rickshi bends oneself backwards and twists the opponent's body until he steps out of the doyo. What is Uchari? That is correct. All right. What percent of wins were by Yorikiri in the past Nagoya Basho? 28%. 30. Not bad. Pretty close. Pretty close. <laughs> I, I did count. It was like almost exactly like 900 out of 90 out of three, 300 matches. Yeah. All right. Wow. Next one is going to test your knowledge of the junior Sanyaku ranks. How many Basho has Mitaki Yumi been in the junior Sanyaku ranks? In total? Yes. Mitaki <laughs> Yumi. Uh, maybe 17. Oh, God. What are you, why are you even talking about this sport? Do Just you even know anything expert. about it? Uh, 25. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yes. Follow up on that. How many Basho has Miyogiryu been in the ju- junior Sanyaku ranks? Ooh. Miyogiryu. Miyogiryu? Yeah, the hardest to pronounce name for me. I can't <laughs> yes. do it. Easily the worst one. Miyogiryu. Myo- 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 yeah. Just imagine he's a Pokemon. Because... <laughs> Stop asking oh, no. the question, John. Oh, Miyogiryu has Komo Sengi Yeah. Jeez, he's been around for a while. Uh, 31. 13. <laughs> right numbers, wrong order. All right. Now, I'm like the guy from the, the Outcast video. <laughs> Pretty fly for a white guy, you know? Yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> there you go. 
There's a color bomb. Now, now we go to our random section. Uh, what is the best color Mawashi? Or uh, banana. No, black is clearly random. the correct answer. Red, red. Random, random, random answers. I don't know. <laughs> All right, here's one that you should get. On what? day 15 of the 1999 Haru Basho, <laughs> who did Ozeki Musashi Maru defeat to win the U show with an overall record of 13 and 2? What year? 1999. What Basho? Uh, Haru. Uh, Masashi Maru Haru. So, Takanohana? Oh, close. Takanonami. I was going to say Takanonami. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say talking about Ami. Damn it. Why didn't I say that? Uh, and, our, and our final question, John. Uh, what is the Bears' all-time record against the Minnesota Vikings? Uh, they've never lost, ever. <laughs> that is the mm. only other correct answer that I could expect from you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As opposed to the other correct answer, which is they are The 56. more correct answer. Yeah. I would say Bears-Vikings must be something like... 110 90 or something like that. <laughs> what? <laughs> 56 60 and 2. Is so that the only when did the Vikings start? Uh, oh, in the 1960s. 60s. Yeah, 60s. Yeah. The Vikings yeah, yeah, were out yeah, in the yeah, 60s. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's right. The Lions are the ones that are going longer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. the Vikings are the youngins in that 50 yes. year old division. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Not, we, it, it used to be, the Buccaneers were there. Yeah. yeah, what was oh, yeah. up with that? Were, were they located somewhere else, or was it just like, no? No, they, they were the expansion team, and so they, they stuck this team from Florida in the NFC North. <laughs> 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 Poor bastards. <laughs> <laughs> NFC Central as it was back then. You know. I mean, they did better than the Lions ever did in that division, so. Yeah. Well, they, no, because what is it? Like when From their expansion, didn't they go nearly two seasons without winning the game? They, yeah. Yeah, they, they went winless their first season. It took them quite a while in their second season to get a yeah. win. Uh, I think the take, NFC North has that accolade that we have, like, until the – did the Browns do it? I, I think we had, like, the only two completely non-winning teams in NFL history for we, – we had the, the Buccaneers from the 70s or something. Oh, and then the Lions. And then, and the, then the, Lions. the Lions. And then, but yeah, then, the Browns went winless yep. uh, 2016, I think. Something so the like Lions – um, I don't know if you've ever read the book Paper Lion, George Plimpton. Nope. So maybe one of the greatest sports books ever written. So he was this, they made a movie out with Alan Alda, but I would skip that. So he was a journalist who, I think it was the New York Times maybe. So he used to do this thing. It was way back in the 60s, like Im- embedding himself in sports. He was trying it out as a regular guy, seeing like you guys with your plan to go into Ozumo, basically. <laughs> but he, he was doing that. So he convinced I think he'd done it in boxing and no, he'd done it in baseball as well. He, he, but he convinced the Lions to let him join training camp and have the coaching staff pretend he was like this third string quarterback or sixth string quarterback. And he'd no football experience at all, but he wrote this book and it was what uh, Hard Knocks is now, like his was that first ever look. And it was the 1960s, so it was a you know very different world in the NFL in those days. And he wrote this brilliant book about his experience, like embedded in the team. So, um, yeah, I have a sumo style version of that book written, is coming out soon. So I'm gonna, that's my plug. It's the whole reason for coming. Out. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, speaking of lions, that just made me think of that now. So uh, yeah, yeah, Vikings. Who cares? <laughs> no. I can't even really get mad. Like, I mean, the Packers I hate with an absolute passion, but oh the, yeah, uh, well yeah. yeah. I think <laughs> we can all get behind the idea that the Packers are the worst, and we all pity the Lions. So yeah. that's it's, it. a, it's, a, it's common ground for us. You know, Bash and Henkes are good. You know, yeah. There you go. <laughs> there we go. We Two got things. three things. <laughs> oh, three. Excuse me. Three things. Yeah. What's the third one? Well, the Packers, the Lions, and the Henka. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> There you go. All right, John. Well, that that's all we really have use for you right now. Um, <laughs> I do feel used, I will say. <laughs> Good. Uh, was I, I, guess, I guess we can give you a platform if you have any final. Are you saying I'm short? <laughs> We've not, never not stood side that. by side. We don't know. The Tom Cruise of Sumo. We saw the picture <laughs> of you with uh, Hokuseho. So yeah, yeah, you must yeah, be yeah. pretty short. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> In fairness, yeah. I mean, yeah. That was like whole Lord of the Rings type thing, right? <laughs> I feel Gandalf. like that when I stand next to Mac. 
Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, if you had any final comments, any uh, final insults you wanted to throw away, anything you wanted to plug, uh, now is your opportunity uh, to say whatever you want. Uh, no, I'm pretty good. Just, you know, love me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Please. Yes, you know. Enough said. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're going to. We're going to go ahead and do our, our regular uh, end of episode spiel. We could probably speed through it real quick. Hey, uh, uh, hold up real quick. Yeah. Um, so we were mainly talking about, um, you know, just current events and sumo and stuff like that, trying to get mm. uh, John's opinion. And also, obviously, you know, the, the salt thrown back and forth. Uh, if you want to learn more about John Gunning himself, uh, that was more what Sumo Kaboom talked to him about uh, a bit on their recent fantastic interview. Check that out on YouTube as well. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that one was fun. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was more fun for me to watch than this one was yes. to participate in, too. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we got to um, edit this crap, Jake. Yeah. Lies and dark side of the force, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's what this is yeah, for. That's right. Yeah. We're the dark side. We're uh, so, so, the general grievances of Sumo. So if you want John Gunning to like you more, go to Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review, or on your yeah. favorite <laughs> podcast listening service. Or you could be just like John Gunning. And you can join our Patreon. Uh, and then if, <laughs> if you sign up at the $1 level, you can get a compliment on any or on any Basho. Uh, we will compliment you at least once during the Basho. Or uh, if you sign up at the $3 level, you can get any topic that you wish us to discuss. Uh, we will talk about it at some point on the podcast. Uh, and and then that uh, Patreon is really important for you guys now because your whole Sumo Erotica OnlyFans plan has gone out the window, right? Yeah, it has. <laughs> no yeah. more porn on OnlyFans. We yeah. gotta make sure <laughs> Patreon. OnlyFans, just when you're about to find your niche, you know, they pull the plug, you know? Sorry, guys. It, what we were planning was just too much. It was beyond anything they had seen before. They Hold had up. to put, they had to put a stop to it. I tell you something, there is sumo porn if you want to find it. There was a, I do not. I Moving on. 100% do not. <laughs> there is a, a DVD called uh, Sumo Club Manager. Uh, you seem to know a lot about this DVD, John. <laughs> I'm informed. I'm informed. You know? So I have read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's good to know these things. So uh. the manager, the cover, she's holding, uh, she's in a red truck, so she's holding like a goodbye. So uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, Extremely 2004, specific. 2004, wow. Yeah. Like that. Two um, bucks. Interesting. <laughs> producer credit goes to John Gunning on it. You know, <laughs> weirdest that, thing. Look at the list of well, credits. Like John Gunning. Like, I, I come in to fix the phone copier in the hair. <laughs> hey, this is. They broken. aren't able to pay with money, so. <laughs> I, I think they just needed to pop your working. You're <laughs> <sitting on it. laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe you can sell it that they just brought you in to consult on the actual sumo rules during the uh, during the plot. <laughs> the inside grip. Take, sure. take, take. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need more Okuri techniques for this take. <laughs> Clearly, your belt technique is lacking. <laughs> All All right, 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 uh, keep going, please. Sumo slang, you know, some of the rikshi use sumo slang. Uh, so kubinage, which is like the next row, that's slang for sex among rikshi, you know. <laughs> when you say sex among rikshi, that's the slang they use among that's each other. Sl- among sex- rikshi. <laughs> that's the, the erotica, the erotica is true. <laughs> oh my oh, god, bro. that's the best thing I've ever heard on this show. <laughs> Anything to do with sumo wrestling? <laughs> Who cares about the rest of the plugs? Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Human. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Grand Sumo Breakdown. Until next time, throw your salt high and keep moving forward.